Psalm 37, 23, and 24. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Mm. All right. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. With his hand. With his hand. For the Lord upholdeth him. John chapter number 6 and verse number 1. And I'm excited to, um, to just to look at God's Word today. And, and John in chapter number 6, verse number 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. John, 1, uh, John uh, 6, verses 1 through 6. And so let's go ahead and read. It says, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And so both of those are for the same place. The Sea of Galilee is also for the Sea of Tiberias, and also it's known as the Lake of Gennesaret. And so those are all that same place. Now I had it printed out, I forgot to bring it, of, of the Sea of Galilee. But the Sea of Galilee is in the northern part of Israel, kind of in the middle, kind of shaped like a pear. And I believe it's about uh, five miles across. No, no, seven miles across, I'm going by memory, seven miles across and about 12 or 13 miles uh, from north to south. So it's a, it's a very large body of water. And so, and so they went across the Sea of Galilee, they um, went over that with the disciples. And it says in verse number two, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. He said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread, that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Peter answered him and said, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them should make, should, should, may take a little. And so and we'll, we can go ahead and, and just, uh, just for the amazingness of the story, we'll go ahead and finish it. But in verse number 8 it says, And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here with, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. So there's 5,000 men and another passage as well in the Gospels different, that tells the same story. It says 5,000 men beside women and children. So there was 5,000 men and the ladies and the children. And so it uh, could have been possibly somewhere up to, to 10,000 to uh, even up to 20,000 according to how many children were there. And so a very large number of people. And then verse number 11, Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And so everybody had as much as they wanted. And so nobody went away hungry. And it says, and, they, and when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the frag fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So five baskets full of leftovers after feeding somewhere between ten to 20,000 people. Then those men which they had seen, the, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And so once again we see Jesus can, can do anything. There's nothing that He can't do. And so let's go ahead and pray and we'll look here to the message today. As I just want to focus in on, especially on verse 
uh, number six. And he said, unto, he, said, he said to him to prove him. This he said to him to prove him that he himself knew what he would do. And let's talk about today, prove me. Prove me. And can we say to God, prove me? And so we'll talk about that here a little bit this evening for a little while. And may the Lord use it to help each one of us. And so let's, let's pray. Father, Lord, it's your word. Thank you for it, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that, Lord, uh, you can uh, lift us up today with your hand. Lord, we, each one of us need you. Each one of us are going through things in our life that where we, uh, we just, we, 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 uh, Lord, without you, we, we realize, Lord, we cannot do it. Each one of us needs some uh, comfort. Each one of us needs uh, understanding that you're in control in these things, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you just take uh, the message today. I pray you use it in a great way because it's your word, not because of me, Lord. May each person remember your word at the end of the service, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, verse number one. And as we mentioned here before, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee. And we talked about what the Sea of Galilee is. We talked about how big it is. And so, um, and, I would, and I would someday like to see the Sea of Galilee. I think it would be an amazing thing to be able to, to look across and see the cross kind of in a valley with mountains. And be able to see across that that, that how, just how big it looks. I know from experiences that a, um, something that's that's several miles long, it almost it almost looks like an ocean. You know, look across it, it looks it looks vast, it looks big. And so I bet it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Actually, standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, but we see that Jesus they went over the Sea of Galilee. And in verse number two, it says there, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So there was this great giant multitude of people following after Jesus because he did miracles. And they saw all the miracles that he did and they're like, man, we want to see a miracle. Or maybe some other people were following because they were saying, we need a miracle. Right? Someone said, I want to see another miracle. Others may have been saying, I want to have a miracle or we need a miracle. And I think even some of us can say that right now. You know, we, need, we need God to do something great in some situation in our life. And so, but I want to say that it, uh, when it comes to fought for a reason to follow Jesus, it says the reason they followed him is because of his miracles. Is that, that I want to say it's not the main reason we should follow Jesus. Just because he can do a miracle is not the main reason we should follow him. And so um, the main reason is because we love God. That should be the main reason. To see him and to know him. To hear his words. To serve God. These are all the more important reasons than for God to do a miracle. And so many today only want to follow God for what he can give them. Not what they can, for what they can give to back to Jesus. So I believe there's a group of people. In fact I know all over the world there's some that would say I want to follow Jesus because I need this, or I need finances, or I need a health problem solved, or I need this situation taken care of. And by the way, he can do all those things. But that's not the reason why we follow him. If he didn't give us any of those miracles, but we had Jesus, and that was it, that would be enough. That would be all we need. And so, um, so I believe that they were following him to see the miracles. I think there, hopefully, there was many of them that was, was, you know, later would follow him because of who he was and Jesus himself. And so, um, but how can, so I ask the question, how can you give yourself to Jesus? How can you, what, what is more important? You know, I was thinking about the wise men. And the wise men, you know, the, 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 the story of, they say, we three kings of Orientar. Well, I don't think there was three to start with, because the Bible doesn't say there were three. But the wise men, they traveled from afar. How far did they travel? So I was trying to figure it out. You know, they said it came from the east. Many think it was over by Babylon or something like that. And so just to kind of give us a slight under, understanding, from Babylon to uh, Jerusalem or Bethlehem in that area would have been about roughly 500 to 700 miles. And they traveled all that way just for what reason? Just to see Jesus. And so all that time, and it probably would have taken at least a month of traveling one way. There could be different uh, estimates. Maybe it, some people say two weeks, some people say two months. I don't know, but I know it took a long time to travel from the east where they were from, and all these wise men with their camels, and they came across, and they came all that way just to take a look at Jesus. And what did they give him when they got there? Gifts. They didn't come there. In fact, some people would say, oh, Jesus, he's going to be born. We got to get over there. We got to find him. When they got there, they would say, all right, Jesus, here's my prayer list. <laughs> I need you to do this, and I need you to help do this, I need you to do this and this. They didn't, they didn't say they asked for anything. They came there, and they saw Jesus, and they said, we have seen the Christ, we've seen the Savior. And they gave him gifts. They gave him gifts. So I'll say that you know, one, one of the things that comes when it comes to serving Jesus, we don't need to, need to be as much worried about what he can give us as what we can give back to him. And so um, that's what we see here, that these, these guys are coming because of the miracles that he did. And so another thing we can give is our obedience. We can give ourselves, 
but we can also give our obedience. And so, let's, before I go any further, let's go over to Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6, verse, uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter number 6, and we'll look there, verse number um, 8. Isaiah chapter number 6, verse number 8. Just to give you a little bit of context of what's going on here, you know, turn back to Isaiah chapter number 5, and we're going to look through several verses. And Brother Jason was talking about a theme. And I think you'll see a theme here real quickly as I read several verses in the book of Isaiah chapter number 5. And so, Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 18. It says, Woe unto them that draw iniquity, iniquity with the cords of vanity, and sin as it were a, a cart rope. So they're drawing, they're pulling sin behind them. And it says, Woe unto them. And then look at verse number 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitterness for sweet and sweet for bitter. So there's some people out there that look at evil things and say, Oh, those are, there's nothing wrong with doing those things. I mean, it's okay to, to do some bad things, too. I mean, no, most other people don't think they're bad. I mean, it's okay if people could do this or commit adultery or all, all different things. I mean, everybody's doing it, right? But they look at things that are good, and they're like, oh, you know what? Those are bad. Look, look at those people, what they're doing. They're, 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 they're not loving everybody because they're speaking out against sin. or they're, you know, Why can't you know, people have abortions? Different things they call evil good and good evil. And he says, woe unto them. They call it good evil and evil good. And then next, number 21, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. And prudent in their own sight. Well, that, that to me is a uh, is a something to think about when it talks about over, especially in the judges says they did what was right in their own eyes. And someone say, why shouldn't we do what's right in our own eyes? And he says, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. Verse number twenty-two. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. So over and over and over it says, woe unto them because they're sin. This is Isaiah, and the people of Israel were. Going against God, they were not following Him, they were doing wicked things, and God had told him to pronounce that judgment, woe unto them for what they're doing. But look here in verse number 25. I wanted to point this out. Because God is saying, I am going to judge you for your sin. The wrong things that you're doing, I'm going to judge you. There it is, says verse 25, there is, therefore the anger of the Lord is, uh, therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against His people. He has stretched forth His hand against them. And he has smitten them, and the hills tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. So what it's showing is God's saying, hey, you have done wrong, and my judgment is coming. Do you see that? But look at the last part of that verse. It says, for all this his anger is not turned away. He says God's anger is not turned away. It's, 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 his judgment is coming out on sin. But then it says his hand is stretched out still. And I kind of look at that, this picture. God is saying to the, the Israelites, he's saying, because of your sin, judgment has come. Because of your sin, you're going to be judged. And my anger is being poured out upon sin. But at the same time, why don't you come back to me? His arms are stretched out still. Why don't you come back to me? I love you. If you'll come back to me, you'll be forgiven. If you'll come back to me, you'll be restored. I think a lot of times that's where we can find ourselves if we're not careful as well. And so, but over and over, Isaiah looked at their sin. He said, woe unto them for their sin. And then look in chapter 6, verse number 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, and this is Isaiah, he said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He saw a vision of God. God allowed him to see a picture of him, or an a, a, a image of him, or his presence. In verse number 2, it says, Above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet. In which way he did fly. We see the same picture also in the other parts of the Bible where it talks about God and His throne. I believe it's in Ezekiel as well. And it says, And the post of the doors moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And so Isaiah saw the Lord. And now next, well, look at the next verse, number five. And this is, this is what he says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So here we have Isaiah. What was his message to Israel? It was, woe unto you. You're going to be faced with God's judgment. You're going to be faced with God's punishment because of your sin. Straighten up, straighten up. You're doing wrong. And then Isaiah saw God on the throne. And then he, I believe he probably fell down upon his face before him. He said, woe is me. It's me. I am a man of unclean lips. I think when you get a good understanding of who God is, we start to see ourselves. 
and we're not so much as focused on others' faults, we start to see ourselves and say, woe is me instead. But I want to point out here as we continue on, and it talks about Isaiah, and then verse number Verse number seven is talking about the judgments and different things that's going on. And it says, And he laid upon he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this this hath touched thy lips, thy iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged, he is saying to him, You're forgiven. And then God is looking for someone that will go and, and, and be a voice. In verse number eight, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So God was saying, he heard this voice saying, and I believe it was being pointed out to, uh, to Isaiah, he's saying we need someone to go with the message, the message of deliverance, the message of help for these people. Who will go? Who will say, who, 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 should, who there's somebody out there needs to go and give the message, the, the truth to these people. Who will go? And Isaiah didn't look around and say, hmm, I wonder who would be a good person. <laughs> who can I pick? You know what he said? God, if you're looking for someone, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. I think that's something that it, what, are you, what can you give to God? That's the question. What can you give to Him? Well, you can say, here am I. Send me. Here am I. I don't know what you need, God, but if you need somebody, I'm available. I'm available. And, you know, God can use you in, a, in an amazing, amazing way if we'll just have that attitude. Lord, send me. And so we see, first of all, that um, how can we give to Jesus? We can give ourselves. We can also give our obedience. And give our obedience. I was talking to Brother Joel Haynes uh, the other day, and he was, um, he was talking about, I think it was actually the, the, before the end of the last year in December, and he says, I've been going through the entire Bible this year, and he says, and I've been looking for a general theme as I go through. And he says, I'm looking for the devil in all those areas of the Bible. So what basically he was saying, I'm looking for the enemy. I'm looking to see where he's at. I want to see how he's affecting God's people and, and trying to destroy. I want to be ready for him. I want him to, to be defeated. That's what he was saying. So he was looking at all the places. He said, you'd be surprised at all the places in the Bible you can find him and how he's trying to cause destruction and, and destroy people's lives. And so he kind of took that as a challenge. And I, you know, as I was, Lord willing, I'll be able to read through the, the Bible this year. And so I took that as a challenge. And so what, can I, what kind of theme can I look for as I go through? And so my challenge was that I would actually uh, find something that where God gave a command and I would try to do it as I go through the Bible. Some command as I'm going through and, and I see that, okay, that's what God says we're supposed to do. So I want to do it. I just don't want to hear it. I want to do it. And so, um, so look, look with me over in, um, into Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. This is a verse that sometimes we sing. I believe some of you already know it by heart. It was just a verse that challenged me um, as I'm reading through my Bible this year. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8 says this, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do. And that's the part right there that I want to, um, to apply. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And so we don't just need to read God's Word. What do we need to do? We need to do it. Do what it says. And so I also want to challenge each one of us to be able to say, God, show me something and then help me to do what it says. So what can we give to the Lord? We can give Him ourself. We can also give Him our obedience. And so let's go back now over to John in chapter number three. three. John chapter six, verse number three. John chapter number six, verse number three. And so it says in verse three, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there He sat with His disciples. And so I can kind of picture... First he goes over the Sea of Galilee, and there's this great multitude that, that had been following him, and he goes up into a mountain, so he's actually, he's actually kind of left where all those people are at, and he's going up into a mountain, and I believe he's overlooking the Sea of Galilee. He's up on this mountain, and him and his disciples are there, and he's overlooking this, 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 this great sea, but there's these shorelines on, the, on both sides, and there's course cities, and it says here... It says, he went up to a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. So I can just see him looking down across all those different parts. And um, by the way, it's, a, it's amazing to be able to do that and to be able to look over this a great body of water. And then verse number four, it says, then the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. And so it just kind of throws that in there, and God doesn't do anything by accident. But it show, it's showing us that there was the, the Passover was coming up. And so I just wanted to give a little bit. We could spend a whole lot of time talking about the Passover. Just a really quick thoughts on the Passover. The feast of the Passover, it took place in Jerusalem. It was established by God to remember the deliverance um, for Egypt, from Egypt, in particular that last plague of the death of the firstborn. And so how many plagues were there? 
uh, that before they left Egypt? Ten. What was the last one? The death of the firstborn, or the Passover. And so, and so anybody that put the blood over the door, the Bible says the death angel would pass over you. And so when God gave them a great deliverance to come out of Egypt, He says, and then from now on you're going to have a feast, and you're going to, of course, uh, have unleavened bread and other things that they would do, but that would be a picture of how you sin out of your life every year. And so it was a picture as well of Jesus, how He would die as a lamb, the, our Passover. And so, so many um, amazing things we could talk about that today. But today the Jewish people not only celebrate Passover as a historic event, but it also in a broader sense to celebrate their freedom um, as Jews from other nations and different things as well. So it's, a, it's still a very big feast uh, holiday for the Jewish people. And so um, here we see that the Jewish holiday of Passover was at nine. And then first number five, it says, When Jesus then lifted up His eyes... He saw a great company come unto him, and he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? So here's Jesus, and I can just kind of picture him sitting up on that mountain, the Sea of Galilee is out in front of him, and he's sitting there with his disciples, and here comes all these people that want to hear Jesus. I mean, the Bible says 5,000 men, and all the ladies, and here they come. And they're coming to hear with Jesus. And Jesus is looking at them, and it's a, a great, great multitude, somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people. And he's watching them come. They're up on the mountain. And he sees all those people. And he looked at Philip. And he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? <laughs> so think about this for a second. If we looked out as we had church today, and before the church service started, we saw about 10 to 20,000 people coming this way. And we knew they were all hungry. And Jesus would say, how are you going to feed them? And so, if you went to Family Dollar to buy some bread, it wouldn't be enough. If you went to Halona and you all bought all the bread in, in, in Zuni, it wouldn't be enough. And you went to Gallup, and you went to Walmart and Safeway, and you kept pulling out all the bread off the shelf, you probably would still not even come close to having enough food for all these people. And so, he looks at Philip, and he says, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? In verse number uh, 6 it says, This he said to prove him, for he knew what he would do. So it's basically like asking him, Philip, and I mean, we're not talking about a small crowd. I mean, talking about thousands of people coming towards him. Philip, so how are we going to feed these people? When will we buy food for them? And he already knew what he was going to do. Why did he, why did he ask that question? Verse number 6, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. I kind of believe that he said it with a little smile on his face. Right? It's almost like, Kind of like, he just wanted to get a response. He just, he's just like, Philip's like, when you ask him, he's like, almost like, are you joking, right? You know what, he, really? You serious? And so, and so, but he said to prove him, because he already knew what he was going to do. And so, he obviously had no, no intention. In fact, there probably wasn't enough bread around even to buy food for everybody. And they were, and they were going to be hungry. They were going to need to eat. And so, um, so I think about that. And all the people that came, he said to prove him, to prove him. And um, why, would he, why would he want to prove him? And so I believe there's different things we can look at when it comes to, to proving. Uh, he said this to prove Philip. And so to prove, and there's also other words that can be used for that, are to tempt or to test. He wanted him to grow. He wanted Philip to grow. He wanted him to understand something about the situation. And so, um, so I want to ask the same question for us. Does God ever prove us? All the time. Does He ever test us? He allows us to be tested. And he does it for our good. He wants us to be able to grow in our, in our faith in different areas. So we're going to look at several areas here when God proves his children. First of all, Philip. So why did he do this? I believe it was to show him that there's nothing too hard for him. There's nothing impossible. So he sees this giant crowd of 10 to 20,000 people coming. He says, Philip, how are you going to buy these people some bread? And he did it to prove him. What was he going to show him? Peter, I mean, Philip, there is nothing too hard for me. There is nothing too hard for me. Philip would look at that and say, are you, are you, are you joking? Are you serious? How we, we, there's no way we can buy that much food for them. In fact, we see that um, it says in verse number, verse number uh, I believe it's verse number 7, Peter answers him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that each one of them may take a little. And so a, uh, it, we see in the Bible how they would actually could, would work all day for a penny, so a penny was worth a whole lot more than it is today. We could say that about probably about 10 years ago, right? A dollar was worth a whole lot more than it was today. And some of you have some elderly folks that they would say the same thing, right? As your mom or dad or your grandparents would say, Oh, I remember when I could buy with one penny three of those big pieces of, of bubble gum, those green and pink and purple bubble gums. Remember those things? And now they're about this big. But back in those days, they were about this long. 
you could buy three of them for a penny. You can't, you can't eat more. So things aren't the same as they used to be. So here we see that it was a penny worth. And so if they could work a whole day and earn one penny, so 200 penny, penny worth would be about 200 days wages. So in our money, we would think maybe somewhere is around maybe, maybe $10,000, uh, $15,000, $20,000, something like that. And he's saying, God, even if we had $20,000, we would still only be able to buy just a little bit for each person. And, and, and where are we going to find all that bread? It's not possible. And so he was showing Philip, Philip, there's nothing that's too hard for me. Nothing is too hard for me. I want to say the same thing. Some of us are here today, and maybe if not all of us, there's some things that, that uh, we can look at right now that's going on in our life. And we'll say, it's, it's just too hard. I don't know how God can fix this situation in my life. I don't know. Uh, uh, do, you, do, you under, do you understand what I'm going through? Most people, it's tough. How can I get through this? You know what God said? There's nothing too hard for him. Nothing too hard for him. And he just wanted to prove that to Philip. Philip, wait, just watch for a second. Just wait. I'm going to show you something. There's nothing too hard for me. Let's look over to Genesis in chapter number 18. I believe that's right. Yeah, Genesis chapter 18, verse number 11. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 11. And let's read here. Genesis 18, 11 says, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So she can no longer have children. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, because God has said you're going to have a child. And she laughed within herself. And later on, they, she would name her son Laughter, which I, that's what Isaac means is laughter, because she laughed. And said, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? And this is a verse I want to point out right here. He says, he says Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Well, what I'm going through is, it seems pretty hopeless, Brother Russell. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Well, you don't know what my family, you don't know my, 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 my sister, my brothers, my uncles, my aunt. You don't know their situation. Brother Russell, can, can, is it possible that they can get help? Is it possible that they can get saved? Is it possible with my situation? Is anything too hard for the Lord? So he did this to prove Philip, because I was going to think he's going to show him. It looked impossible. In fact, it was, but not with God. Is anything too hard for the Lord? There's nothing that's too hard for him. And so, first of all, we can prove uh, when God proves his children, we see Philip, and I believe he's showing them there's nothing too hard for him. Then we see Abraham. So let's turn now to Genesis 22. Genesis chapter number 22 and verse number 1. Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 1 here. And we'll just read a few verses here. We won't read the whole passage. I think many of you know what the, the passage but it says, and it came to pass after these things. That God did tempt Abraham, and that's, I believe it's that same word, prove or test. He gave him a test and said unto him, Abraham, and he says, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering unto me. All oh, it says, Of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, he obeyed, and he went up there to do just what God told him, but God did not allow him to kill his son, and he spared him. But I just want to look at this right here where it said, it says, and God did tempt Abraham. Now, I was looking at that, that root of that word, and that's the same word that we get not only tempt, but also temper. And so, so when you take a, uh, and, and Brother uh, Ross uh, did a whole lesson on, on metal and how to make a knife and different things. But I didn't really understand. I thought when they, uh, when they would take a knife and they would temper it, it would make it harder even. It would make it just, you know, even harder than before. But that's not the case. They had already gone through the process to make it hard. When they temper it, it actually doesn't make it harder, it makes it tougher. So if you take cast iron, cast iron is very, very hard. You know what happens if you hit cast iron with a hammer? It'll break if you hit it hard enough. But so, what, so what they're doing is they're actually making it not harder, they're actually making the metal softer, but they're making it tougher when they, when they temper it. So they put it through a process where they get it to a certain temperature, but they don't want to go over a certain temperature because it'll melt, and they keep it at that temperature, and then they let it slowly cool down, it tempers it, it makes it tougher but not harder. It's actually becomes softer, but it comes, becomes tougher. So how does that make sense? Well, God, I believe when He tempts us, it makes us tougher, but it also makes us softer. 
so we don't have that hardness, that hard heart. We become soft to Him. We become pliable that He can use us. But it makes us tougher in this at the same time. And so, um, so He tempted him. He tempted Abraham, and He made him, I believe, uh, more pliable, more usable, but also uh, made him tougher. It made him, it made him stronger in that sense. And so, um, so He's going to do the same thing to us. We, we need it. We need it. And He allowed him to be tempted, but He, um, he did that to, to Abraham, I believe, so He could bless them. So he could bless him. And so he tempted Abraham. But now let's look and see the blessing that came after. And so look at verse number 15. This is afterward and after he had, he of course, offered up an, uh, an offering instead of his son, the, the ram that was caught in the thicket. And in verse number 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto him, called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. And he said, be, uh, says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so I want to say here today that sometimes God tests us because he wants to bless us. When we go through that hard thing that we're going through, and we say, God, I'm just going to keep obeying you as I go through it. And when you're going through it, you're going to say, this doesn't make sense. I don't know why I'm doing this. But God, if you said, if this is what you said to do, I'm going to keep on doing what you told me to do. And some of it might make sense. It's just hard because of maybe struggles that are going on in your life. But you know what's right. And you say, God, I am going to do what you said to do because you said it. And I know it's right. And you just keep on obeying. And I can promise you God's going to bless that. You obey him. God's going to bless you. In fact, uh, that's how God blesses. Over and over in the Word of God, you see when people obey, and you see God would bless. That's how God's blessings come. And one time someone came up to me, and they said, uh, or I think it was a phone call, and they said, um, could you uh, go around and bless the houses where someone passed away? Go to the houses where they passed away and, and bless them, because, you know, we have a, someone passed away, we've got the, the medicine man to bless it for those who are traditional, and you can bless the houses too, and that'll kind of cover everything. That way people will move back in the house. And I had to tell them, you know, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna bless. I can't bless a house. Blessings come when people obey Him, not when you go in and do some kind of ritual to bless a house. That doesn't bring blessing. And so, if you want God to bless your life, how do you see His blessing? By obeying Him. And that's what we see with Abraham. So God tested Philip, I believe, to show him there's nothing too hard for for God, nothing impossible. God blessed Abraham, so He could. Uh, God tempted and tried Abraham, so He could bless him as well. And of course, He did. And last of all, over in Deuteronomy chapter number 8, as we look at um, when God proves His children, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, we see here the, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And uh, it's, to me it's pretty amazing how God shows here as well that when He tests and improves us, He of course can bless us afterwards. So let's look at um, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, I'm in Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 15. It says here, it says, Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. So the children of Israel went through some tough times in the wilderness. They, they were thirsty, God provided for them. They were hungry, God provided for them. There was fiery serpents, and God actually provided a way for um, healing. And so over and over, but they were going through trials in the wilderness for 40 years. God tried them in the wilderness. Then look at verse number, um, verse number 16. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee. So what is one of the reasons why he tries us? To humble us. To make us humble before him. Because a pride person is going to fall. A humble person he can lift up. So that he might prove thee, that's that testing, to do thee good at thy latter end. So God's reason to bring us through proving and testing is that it'll be better for us in the end. Does that make sense? That's what He wants for us. And so, yes, we will go through some, some times when He tests us, but He's going to make us better, and He's going to bless us for it, and it's going to increase our faith in the end. And so, so uh, when God proves His children, prove me. Can we say that? Prove me. And then the next thing I want to look at here is when God's children prove God. So the first we looked at when God proves His children. Now let's look at when God's children prove God. And so let's look at some places that actually talk about us proving God. And so I want to look first over to, to another passage in Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. And this is talking about tithing. And, um, but I just want to read it here because God says prove me. 
in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10. He says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And then he says this, Prove me. Who is saying that? God is saying, Prove me. And now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, If I will not open up the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that ye, there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the de devourer, which I believe would be the devil, for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall thy vine cast forth her fruit before the time in the field, that I believe would be your offspring. And the, and the Lord of, saith the Lord of hosts. So here God says, prove me. Prove me. Prove me when it comes to obeying me, when it comes to giving. Prove me. And I want to say, um, can we take God at His word? Can we test Him? Okay, God, let's see what you can do. And so I just took that, take that as a challenge as well. God, uh, is it possible if we give to you that you're going to uh, take care of us and you're going to um, you're not going to let us go without? And it's, it's going. To, he said, "Prove me. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it." So first of all, I just want to say, when it comes to our giving, uh, can we prove God? Yes. And I just want to challenge you. I'll challenge you. Know, challenge myself. We can prove. We can prove him. And then, last of all, here and uh, last of all, as we look at when God, when God's children, when when God's children prove God. Let's look over in Daniel chapter three. I was thinking of an example of this. So let's look over in Daniel's chapter number three, in verse number five. And we'll read just a couple verses here as well, and, and we'll be finishing up. But Daniel chapter number three, and verse number five. And I'll get there in just a second. Another familiar passage, but I just want to look at just a couple thoughts here. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Daniel 3, 25. He said, this is after that um, the three Hebrew children would not bow. They were in the fire. They had already been thrown into the fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar said this. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. And there was three, by the way. He says, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes and the governors and the captains of the whole, uh, king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, nor were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire was passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, and that's, I believe it's Jesus, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they may not serve uh, nor worship any god except their own god. And so here we see these three Hebrew children, and I believe they were standing there, and there was a fiery furnace that was very, very hot. And they're looking at that fiery furnace. And they're looking at that. In fact, they probably didn't. It says they didn't even have to, to think about it too long. They look at that giant image made of gold that was there. And they look at that fiery furnace. And you know what they said? We're going to prove God. We're going to prove God. And I believe that what they were trying to prove him with was their faith. They said, God, even if we get thrown into that fire and we die, by faith we're going to see you real soon. But if we don't die, then God, you're going to deliver us. And so either way, I believe their faith was extremely, extremely strong. So uh, when it comes to our own life today, how do we apply this, what we're going through? Can you trust God that he knows what he's doing and he can deliver you from the different things you're going through? It may not be in this life or maybe it is. We don't know either way, but we can still say, God, I'm going to trust you no matter what. And to me, that's uh, something that was helpful to me because there's so different things that we can all go through. And so I say, are we willing to take by faith and say, God, if you prove me, if it can strengthen my faith, or no matter how it takes place, I'm still going to have the faith in you to say, God, I know that you are in control and I'm going to trust you through all these tough things that I'm going through. Yes, it may be hard. Yes, it may be a struggle. But God says, prove me. Have faith in me. Trust me. And God can allow us to go through those things as well, and we can, we can trust Him. So will you, um, will you have faith in God? Will you have faith in Him and trust Him no matter what you're going through? And so I have a couple quotes here I wanted to give you, and then we'll be finished. First one was by William Carey. This is what he said, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. You know what that's going to take? 
strong faith. I think William Carey proved God and said, God, I'm gonna prove, I, wanna, I wanna attempt something big for you, and I want you to, uh, I, I'm just gonna do, by faith, I wanna see you do something amazing. And then also, um, this was a quote that I remember, just, and I don't know if it's exactly written down right, but I tried to remember it. So I remember when I was at camp a long time ago, some of you kids have been to camp and heard a lot of different things. But I remember this when I went to camp. And it was a man there um, that was preaching by the name of Eric Capace, and he said, he said, he gave us this quote. He said, attempt something so great for God that when God does it, everybody will know that it had to be God that did it. It had to be God. It couldn't be you. He said, attempt something so big for God that it had to be God that would actually do it, and everybody will know that it wasn't you. And so I said, you know what? What would that take? I'll take faith. Prove him. Prove God. Is God big enough to do anything? Let's prove him. And so um, prove me. And so he proves us, but he also asks us to prove him. Basically what he's saying is, I am God, my word is true, and I will do what I say I will do. Can we prove him to see that he will do what he says he will do? He will every time. So let's go ahead and end with that. Father, Lord, I pray you help us as we know that there's going to be a testing, a tempering, a time when you make us tougher to become what you want us to be, and also a time when you make our hearts softer so it can be more useful for thee. But Lord, also, Lord, you ask us to prove you. And so uh, are we willing to do that? That's going to take great faith because you say that if we'll, if we'll approve you, if we'll do a certain thing, then you'll do a certain thing. We can always know that you will, but it's going to take faith to see you do it. So, Lord, I pray you bless in uh, following you, and I pray that we can apply this to our everyday life and as we uh, face some tough things. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.